So today we're continuing a series on questions and answers of asking questions of Jesus and having Jesus provide us with the answers. I know that three weeks ago you heard a message about temptations. Last week was a message about finances. And today is going to be a message about the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bible, let's, let's dive into the scripture where Jesus in John chapter 16 verse 7, he says the following, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So Jesus is telling his disciples who just got used to him, they have seen him perform miracles, they have seen him, I mean Jesus has been a great example. Jesus was like the big deal for them. And toward the end of his ministry, three and a half years, Jesus looks at his disciple and says, hey guys, just giving you a heads up, it's actually going to be better if I'm going to leave. Now I understand it's in red, so it's Jesus' words. And I understand it's, prop, it's, it's the truth, amen? But there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that's the truth. You're reading and you're like, uh, I'm not sure about that. Because let's, let's be real. If Jesus would have been on earth right now, it would have been incredible. If he would have been in Israel, I would be the first person buying the ticket, getting the local hotel over there, and I would not be a Christian trying to get to Jesus. I will cut corners. I will push people probably. I would lose my Christianity and trying to get to Jesus. And then once I get to Jesus, I will ask you for forgiveness, of course. <laughs> right? We will all do that. But think about this. Jesus was on earth for three and a half years. Most of the people who were religious never embraced him. Actually, crucified him. What makes you think you wouldn't be those people? Since we're religious. The people who were his followers for three and a half years, you would think their life would be changed. Most of them, the Bible says, many of them got offended at him and left him. The ones who didn't get offended denied him and one guy took his own life. So, having Jesus physically around us, we saw the results. Jesus actually is, there's a fact that what Jesus is saying, it's better that I leave because when the Holy Spirit will come in and we see the results of the coming of the Holy Spirit, book of Acts shows us that these cowards, these offended people, these religious people, the Pharisees, the Pharisees were being saved. People who are his followers were being transformed to go from being cowards to being courageous. Their life was being transformed and changed. They shook the world upside down. None of them took their life. They laid their life down for Christ. There is power in the Holy Spirit. Somebody did some math and they, they came to this conclusion that if Jesus could physically minister 14 hours a day to people, and 14 hours a day is a lot of work. Some of us who work, you know, 10 hours and four days a week, it's a lot of work. 14 hours a day. If he could see people for 60 seconds, one person, 60 seconds. He would be able to see about 840 people in one day. But how many of you agree you need more than 60 seconds? Because the problems you got with your wife is like you need six hours to explain why she's wrong, why he's wrong. The crazy kids, what about the neighbors? You know, what about the other people, the relatives, the family members? We need more than 60 seconds. So, but let's just imagine you would have 60 seconds with Jesus. If that would be possible, if Jesus would have, be, would have been on this earth, you know that it would take Jesus two million years to see seven billion people for 60 seconds. Jesus says, it's better that I leave. Because when the Holy Spirit will come in, you can call him anytime, for no reason, not for 60 seconds, for six, seven hours every single day if you want to. He will always be available and he will use you, he will impact you. And Jesus said this, works I do, he said when the Holy Spirit will come in, there will be greater works. Because they will not be done just through one person, they will be done through many people. Today God is moving in this world. That's why book of Acts doesn't have a man at the end. Because the acts of the Holy Spirit are still continuing through you, through me, and through the church in this world. Can somebody say amen? God is still moving. God is still healing people. God is still saving people. God is still changing people. God is still breaking the chains of people's lives. God is still reconciling people. God is still resurrecting people and reconciling people. Can somebody say praise God? And so right now we're going to dive in and look at the example that Jesus left us of what it's like to walk with Holy Spirit. What it's like to live with the Holy Spirit. What it's, because 
sometimes we can look at preachers, pastors, your own life and start to develop doctrine from our experiences which is dangerous. We have to develop and derive our doctrine from the Word of God and from the example of Jesus. Jesus is the perfect theology. Jesus is the standard. Not even David from the Bible, not even Apostle Paul and Peter. These guys are great. Their lifestyle is great. We imitate them as they imitate Christ. But Jesus is it. Can somebody say amen? And so I want you to write down number one is that Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' birth was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. His birth was natural. He was born naturally, but he was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 18, it says the following. Now the birth of Jesus Christ were as is followed. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. This may sound kind of crazy, but the Holy Spirit was Jesus' biological father. He was his father. The Holy Spirit was the one that gave Jesus that birth. Now, Jesus is not the only one who had Holy Spirit as his father. When you got born again, the Holy Spirit became your father because we were born from the Holy Spirit. Amen. First time when we got born, the Bible says that we were born with a sinful nature called flesh. So on your first birthday, the devil has given you a gift and you have opened that gift and been using ever since. It's called the flesh. The flesh is this bad thing within us that wants to do bad. When you get born again, when you get saved, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you surrender your evil ways to the Lord, you put your faith in Jesus as your only way and the only salvation, God the Father not only gives you a new heart, not only He writes your name in the book of life, not only He gives you gift of righteousness, not only He gives you adoption, you become His child, but God the Father gives you a gift at that moment called the Holy Spirit. Not when you start speaking in tongues, not when you get your act together, not when you stop cussing, not when you stop smoking, not when you stop sleeping around, but the moment you get saved, in that moment the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so now we have a problem. As exciting as that is, because we got flesh with our first birth, we got the Holy Spirit with our second birth, we got a conflict inside. Your salvation doesn't solve problems, it creates conflict. Because before it was easy, it was just the flesh. Now we have the flesh and the Holy Spirit. You don't live a holy life because you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit to have a potential for a holy life. But it's yielding to the Holy Spirit that brings holiness. Yielding to the Holy Spirit that brings victories. It explains why many Christians still live defeated lives even though they are genuinely born again. Because being genuinely born again doesn't give Holy Spirit automatic control. It gives Him a presence inside of you but it's still your part to yield to the Holy Spirit or to yield to the flesh. In my house, you know, I have my wife in my house. I sleep with my wife. Praise be to God. Amen. <laughs> but there is, there is one more female that lives in our house and she helps us with the house. She helps, she runs a few teams in our church and we help her with that. And she is a friend, she is an acquaintance, but she is not my wife. I am not close to her. Hi, bye, how you doing? That's about it. But my wife, I am close with, I am intimate with, I share my life with. And that's kind of like how it is. Inside of you, there's a flesh who can be a roommate because you can't get rid of your flesh, you're going to have to constantly crucify it and then it gets resurrected next day. Your flesh doesn't disappear. You can't cast out your flesh. It's always going to be there as long as you live. You just have to learn not to be intimate with your flesh. But you have to be close with the Holy Spirit. And many of us, we have the Holy Spirit as a roommate, but the person we're really intimate with is the flesh. And we think having a Christian bumper sticker or going to a church or even passing a growth track or even speaking in tongues, it automatically makes you victorious. Actually, who are you, quote unquote, sleeping with? Who are you intimate with? Who are you close with will determine whether you will live a holy life or a sinful life. Amen. Having the Holy Spirit is great. But when the Holy Spirit has you, it's best. Amen. When you were born physically, 
You came with legs right away. You were born with legs. Legs came as part of the package. God, the creator, gave you legs, not as a reward for learning how to speak. It was a gift. But learning to walk with the legs you got took some time, some practice, patience, falling and getting up, right? None of us walked out of our mother's womb. <laughs> None of us walked out of the hospital. We walked out like, what's up, dad? Good to see y'all. Let's get ready. What are we doing here? None of us did that. We, we were crawling for months. We were crawling. We had the legs. We had the potential. They could carry us. I mean, yes, they were a little fragile, a little chunky and chubby, but, but they had the potential to carry us. Instead, we dragged our legs everywhere. They were, they were there. They were given to us, but we didn't know how to walk in them until it took us some time. And we were so lucky because we were surrounded by people who learned how to use their legs. Because if we would be surrounded by our mom and dad who still crawled, we would crawl all our life thinking that's normal. See, when you were born again, Holy Spirit is like legs. God gave him as a gift auto automatically. But to walk in the Holy Spirit takes some time, takes practice, takes surrender, takes paying attention to the Holy Spirit, takes acting on the prompting stakes, learning the scriptures. And the best benefit is when you're surrounded with other people who walk in the Holy Spirit. Because if you come to a church or you come to an environment where everyone has the Holy Spirit, but they still crawl in flesh, you will think that's normal Christian life and you will never take advantage of the gift of the Holy Spirit living inside of you many of you you carry the Holy Spirit I want to challenge you today to allow the Holy Spirit to carry you don't be like that lame man in book of Acts who the Bible says he was brought to the temple he had the legs they just didn't walk and that's why he was never in the temple he was outside of the temple and he was not there praising God he was there begging but when Peter came, Peter didn't give him legs. He just gave him his hand and he says, listen, get up. And the strength came into the legs he had. And he got inside and inside of the church, he wasn't begging, though he still had the same problems. He still didn't have a job. He still needed money, but he was praising God. He was worshiping God. See, when you learn to walk in the Holy Spirit, you will still have challenges in life, but your attitude is going to be different. You don't have to be bribed to come to church. You don't have to be brought to church. You will come to church by yourself because you got the legs. You got the Holy Spirit because you walk with God. Everyone has the Holy Spirit who is Christian. But the Holy Spirit does not have every Christian. He only has those that surrender. So you can write this down. We get the Holy Spirit by salvation, but the Holy Spirit gets us by surrender. When we live surrendering to Him instead of our flesh, Holy Spirit begins to possess us in a positive way. He begins to lead us. He begins to fill us and we begin to walk in Him. Christians have Holy Spirit as a doctrine. You will have Him as a friend. Some people will have Him as, oh, I'm Pentecostal or I'm charismatic or I believe Holy Spirit is the third person of Trinity to you. Uh, he said, I live with Him. I talked to him this morning. He is my friend. I'm not belittling him as God, but he was, he came to live inside of us. Not just to be big almighty, but to be close. I believed in God who lives in heaven all my life. But when I started to experience the, the reality of the Holy Spirit, I started to believe in God also who lives inside of me. You can fellowship with Holy Spirit. You can talk to the Holy Spirit. You can have Him lead your life. You can have Him carry the, the heaviness, the burdens of your life instead of crawling in a Christian life. And for that to happen, you really have to break this myth in your mind that the Holy Spirit is it. He is not it. He is a person. Just because He's presented in the Bible as a wind, the fire, oil, you know, as a dove. It doesn't make him those things. Jesus is presented as a lion. Yet when I was singing today, Jesus, Jesus, I wasn't thinking about Simba. <laughs> Jesus is presented as a lamb, except when today when I was worshiping God, in my mind, like I don't have association with the sheep. I don't have a four-legged animal in my mind. I see like a man, a Jewish man, you know, probably blue eyes, long beard. I have association with the person because though Jesus has these symbols about who he is and his character, we relate to him as a person. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, many of us, when we think of the Holy Ghost, we're like, a ghost. 
And then you, could, you think about it, Harry Potter or Narnia, just kind of like, how do, what do we find a connection? And then if you grew up in charismatic circles, it's probably like shaking and baking, like people are like, ooh, that's probably Holy Ghost. Like, I'm not sure I want that. It's just going to stick with Jesus. It's going to save here. Safe zone. Come on, preach. I'm going to tell you something that kind of rocked my world. I remember when I started to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and I said, I said, Father God, why didn't you give Holy Spirit a body? I mean, if you want us to fellowship, as it says in Corinthians, to fellowship of, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with us, and fellowship is a two-way street, unless you have a dysfunctional marriage, right? In a dysfunctional marriage, fellowship is only a woman talks and a man listens. But in a healthy relationship, fellowship is both ways talking. Are you with me? And so fellowship with the Holy Spirit is both way talking. Holy Spirit talking, you talking. It's that fellowship with Him. And I said, Lord, if you wanted the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to happen with us, you could have made it a lot easier if you wouldn't present the Holy Spirit as a ghost, as a wind, as oil, as fire, and as a dove. I was like, we don't relate to those things. And I felt the, the Lord answer me back in my heart. And He said, Jesus chose, chose a Jewish body. I asked the Holy Spirit which body he wanted, he chose yours. You have a problem with that? And I was like, wow. So Holy Spirit does have a body. Look in the mirror. That's his body. He chose your body. He chose my body. He's no less than a person than Jesus and the Father just because he chose your body. Don't let the analogies of who Holy Spirit is mess your understanding. He's not a force. He's not tongues. He's not power. He is a person who has power, who can be very forceful. Like he can come against the enemy like a flood. He is a person who gives tongues, who gives prophecy and everything, but he is a person. I have a TV in my house. It was given to me by a Marine four years ago. Nufo is his name. He came and got saved in our church. He didn't have the concept of tithing, so he bought a TV in my house and he says, this is my tithing to the church. I was like, I don't think that's how it works, but I'm like, you know what, I'll keep the TV. We'll figure out the doctrine later. <laughs> Nufo moved to Hawaii. I actually have not talked to Nufo in about two years. I still have the TV. TV and Nufo are two different things. Speaking in tongues, having certain gifts, and having a relationship with the Holy Spirit are not always the same thing. We as Christians can learn how to bara mazda, shara bara handa. You know, like speak in tongues and everything. We, we can even have certain gifts operating and not even develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it's good to have the gifts operating in our life. It's good to work on your character. But what I want to challenge you with today is don't just be the person who uses the TV and lost the connection with the person who gave it. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person who gives gifts. We are to use His gifts, stay active in His gifts, but never lose the contact, friendship, and closeness with the person Jesus relied on all of His ministry. Amen? Amen. The second thing I want us to see is not only Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit, but Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see that at His baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, it says the following is that when Jesus had been baptized, He came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to Him and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting upon Him. Paul also says in Ephesians that don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with Holy Spirit. Paul kind of uses the contrast between getting drunk and being filled with Holy Spirit. He's not reducing the presence of the Holy Spirit to a liquid water or liquid, liquid drink. He was just saying that there is a similarity in the way people get drunk and the way people get filled with Holy Spirit. For example, now I understand none of us in here drink. None of us in here ever got drunk. We're all holy people. Amen? Amen. But let's just imagine, for example, that you were the old you, BC days, before Christ, and you know, you, you wanted to get drunk. Getting drunk doesn't happen automatically. Like, there's not, no such a thing as Jack Daniels chooses random people on the weekend and say, I'm just going to knock in their house, break through the door. I know they're like studying the Bible. I'm just going to jump on them, like get inside of their system and make them drunk. It never happens like that. Getting drunk is, is, is a choice. And the choice starts with this. You make a decision. And the weekend comes up and you say, you know what? I mean, some people get drunk at home, but typically it happens in bars. They say, you know what? I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to go to a bar. You don't get drunk by getting in the bar. You can go in the bar and drink H2O. 
But once you get to the bar, you're still going to get drunk. Then you ask the, the, the waiter, the, the bartender, say, hey, can, can I have me one of those things? They bring it to your table. You still don't get drunk by having that alcoholic drink in front of you. You have to open your big mouth, put that from the bottle into your system, and then it does something that you can't explain, but you don't care because it feels different. It makes you change. It makes you, if you're like a shy person, you become loud. If you're a reserved person, you become so like just open-minded, just talkative and everything. It changes you. You, don't ex you can't explain it. You just know it's real. Right? Yeah. I understand you have no experience with that. Your neighbors probably do. But that's kind of how it happens. And Paul says, don't do that. But do this. Paul is comparing filling of the Holy Spirit to that. Why? Because he's breaking misconception that filling of the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit's job. Many of us think that Holy Spirit just kind of randomly on Sunday goes mini mini. Uh, yeah, her. Let me just fill her right now. Uh, no, I, won't, I will ignore him today. I will ignore him. Him, him. Let me just. Uh, oh, he's a pastor. Let me fill him. That's not how it works. You get in a, in a car. You drive to church. The worship leader begins to present the song. It's your moment to zip the lip or open the mouth. When you open the mouth and you begin to sing along, something begins to happen. You can't explain it. People say, good vibes. Feel great, felt great. Something lifted. We don't have the right vocabulary, but we know with this, we walk out of this room and we say, something is changing. I feel different. What happened? You get filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to see this. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit because he left his home. He went to a meeting where John the Baptist was preaching and doing his thing. Jesus got to that meeting and at this meeting, Jesus just didn't sit on the back and say, I'm just going to see how it works out. I'm just going to see how John is. I'm going to uh, grade John's ministry. I kind of feel like John is not measured up to my anointing because John is like not healing people. I don't see demons coming out of people. Um, I don't see resurrections. Lepers are not being cleansed. He's dunking people into water. What is the fire? The fire. I need the fire. Jesus doesn't stand there and judge and criticize and say, hey, Johnny, come over here. Uh, I'm not going to leave a five-star review on your Google ministry page. I feel like you, you still have a lot room to grow. Jesus doesn't have that attitude, even though he probably had every reason to do that. Jesus gets to the meeting. John is doing his thing, and Jesus lines up in prayer, in the baptism, to get baptized into the dirty Jordan River. And John stands and says, Jesus, this is not for you. This is the people who went through growth track. You, you created growth track. That's not for you, Jesus. Stay away from this. We're getting them baptized to get them prepared for you. You're the main attraction. Jesus, John, I know. I want to like do the obedience part. Get me baptized, John. Just, just, just stop the talking. Just, let's do it. He gets Jesus into water and everybody's getting baptized. They're putting their nose, closing their nose. But Jesus is different. The Bible says when he was in the water, he was praying. I think Jesus was like, don't worry about the nose. And he's praying there. If there's anybody who did not need to pray, it was Jesus. He is God. He, kind of, he could do just fine without prayer. He's standing there in the water. He shouldn't be there. That's not his thing. And he's praying. And when he's getting out of the water, the Bible says the Holy Spirit fills him. Filling of the Holy Spirit is when you are staying, obeying, and praying. Wow. Yeah. Staying in what God is doing in your church. It might not be something you like because you're not used to that. Where you're coming from. You're like, this, uh, this thing, I, I, the church I grew up in, you know, we, we didn't do it like that. Well, because you went to church three times a year, and of course they didn't do it. You didn't, you didn't see what God was doing there. But when you come here and you see God is doing something, even if you're not used to it, get in the line. Get with the program. Don't be a spectator. Be a participator. And God will begin to fill you. And then do the obedience part, meaning do what God is asking you to do at this season. If he's asking you to start giving, start giving. If he's asking you to lead a small group, start leading a small group. If he's asking you to join a home group, if he's asking you to be honest with your wife about something that you've been struggling with, listen, get on with the program with obedience to God. See, being filled with Holy Spirit is not some spiritual depth. It's very practical. Jesus gives us the example. It's staying, it's obeying, and it's praying. And then God begins to fill you. A lot of us are struggling with emptiness right now. We feel like it's, we're empty. You may say, but I come to church, I'm empty. Well, you can go to the bar and never get drunk. You can go to church and never get filled if you don't get on with the program, if you don't obey, and if you don't pray. Amen? 
I want us to look at number three. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. So not only he was filled by the Holy Spirit, but he was led by the Holy Spirit. It says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, so right after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, and then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Write this down. Whatever you are filled with, you will be led by. Instead of focusing on being led by the Spirit of God, and kind of like, I'm all for reading books on how to hear God's voice. I'm all for going to seminars on how to hear God's voice. I'm all for that, studying more on how to discern God's voice from other voices. But, but if you really focus on being filled, it will come so naturally, you will be surprised. You will be able to discern the voice of God from the voices of so many other people if you are filled with God. When I was younger, I even fasted. I said, Lord, I want to hear your voice. But then I started to grow in the Lord and started to understand is that God's voice is not the problem. It's the fact I'm so far from Him sometimes that when He speaks, I can hear Him. Let's just imagine that you are in the parking lot right now, in your car, and I'm standing here in the stage. We have speakers, and I'm shouting on the top of my lungs, okay? You're not going to be able to hear me in your car. Now, you can text me and say, Vlad, a little bit louder. <laughs> then I can scream even more louder until to the point that everybody in this room is like, ah! You're still not going to hear me. The problem is not that I don't have speakers big enough. It's the distance between us is a little bit too big. If you want to hear God, what God is saying is this, get filled with me, means bridge the gap between me and you. Let's get close. And then listen, I don't have to scream. I can whisper. You will know that you know that you know that you know it was me. Why? Because whatever you're filled with, you will be led by. If you're filled with you, you will begin to only hear your voice. You will be confused about whether God is speaking or not. But when you begin to be filled with Him, it will come naturally. I'm not saying we don't need pastors to guide us or mentors, small group leaders. We do all need that. We need books, we need seminars. But nothing comes close to being filled. Jesus was led after He was filled. Being led by the Holy Spirit is so exciting. Sometimes it doesn't start with God leading you to something amazing. With Jesus, it started with God leading him into something called wilderness. So sometimes when God starts speaking at first, it will not always be like you come into the church and God's like, um, this neighbor has a problem with their spouse. Typically how it will start is God will say, you have a problem with your spouse. God will start with something, uh, you need to honor your parents. Pick up that vacuum and vacuum that house as you've told your parents 300 million times that you will do and you haven't done so. Sometimes it will start with things that honestly will kill your flesh instead of give you some kind of a grand ministry. But that will always lead to greater measure of God's presence in your life. There was one doctor, in his, uh, his name is Dr. Crandall. In, 2000, in 2006, in Palm Beach, there was a man who was going to work. He was going through a very difficult time in his life, Jack, uh, Jeff Markins. And he had a heart attack on the way to the hospital. And he died on the, on the table in the hospital. And Dr. Crandall was doing the thing of trying to bring him back to life. And for 40 minutes, they were working on this dead body, trying to bring him back to life. And they failed. They were not able to do it. And so they lost this man. The Dr. Crandall wrote up his death certificate, signed it already, the time of death. Everything was done with. The nurse was preparing the body. And Dr. Crandall was going quickly to the next meeting because he was very busy. On the way in the hospital, the Holy Spirit prompted Dr. Crandall not to rush to the meeting, but go back and pray for Jeff for his resurrection. Now, Dr. Crandall has no experience in praying for the resurrection. He's a scientist. He's a medical doctor. He's very known all, all around the world. And so he right away says, first of all, I am busy. Secondly, this is not a prayer room. This is a hospital. Thirdly, I worked on this guy for 40 minutes. He's dead. God, we don't do this stuff here. We, I gotta go. I gotta go. And the voice wouldn't leave him. And Dr. Crandall is a man of God. He walks with God, though he's a doctor. He's filled with God. So he knew that, you know what? I'm just going to go and obey. He goes back to Jeff's body and prays for Jeff's body and says, Lord, if this man does, did not know you, and if he's not saved, please bring him back to life in Jesus' name. Simple prayer. He says, I had a little bit of faith. I had no faith at all for his resurrection or anything of that sort. Plus, he's never seen anything like that. He asked the nurse, he says, brought some other nurse. He says, I want you to shock him again. The nurse looked at him. He says, we can't do that. We've been doing it for 40 minutes. Doctor, we can't do that. He says, for me, shock him again. 
when they shocked Jeff's body, perfect heartbeat came. The surprising part is he did the work on his body afterwards. He found out even no residue of heart attack. He was dead for so long, he should have had a brain damage. He says, this man, and you can watch it on YouTube, he speaks normally, his children testify. Turns out that Jeff, when he died, he went to hell. And God gave him mercy, brought him back to life. But if it wouldn't be for Dr. Crandall to obey the promptings of God in the middle of busy schedule in the hospital, Jeff would have been burning in hell today. Leading of the Lord can save your life and can save people around you. Sometimes God gives you a prompting to invite your co-worker, to pray for somebody. And don't, don't get all, ah, this is not me, I'm not a person. Listen, obey the Holy Spirit. You'll be surprised what He will do in your life. I'm not giving you a license to do weird stuff. I'm not saying everything that comes into your head, you go do, okay? We have to submit the voices with the voice of the Holy Spirit and the scriptures, amen, and common sense. And secondly, if you're a married man and you have a, in your heart to like sell your house and go be a missionary, ask your wife first. Because <laughs> you might be a missionary by yourself over there, okay? And are suffering for Jesus and a little bit of foolishness and stuff. So we have to always ask our spouse. If you're single, ask your parents. But if you're married, you got to ask your wife. Because the same Holy Spirit who can talk to you, he has enough power and grace to convince your wife. If he doesn't convince your wife, stick with your wife. <laughs> Number four. Not only Jesus was filled with Holy Spirit, but Jesus was sustained by the Holy Spirit. I want you to see that Jesus was filled with Holy Spirit. He got into the wilderness and in the wilderness we see in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 when Satan attacks Jesus. Jesus replies back and he says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want you to see this. Is it feels like in the wilderness the Holy Spirit's presence wasn't felt. Anybody who's been in the wilderness or if you're a seed died in a house, you, you realize that God leaves. You don't feel the presence in the wilderness. You feel heat, you feel temptation, you feel lost, you feel confused. That's why it's called wilderness. And a lot of times we get discouraged because our high moments with God where the heaven was open, the spirit came like a dove, the word was spoken, you're the son of God. Man, I feel the leading of God to fast, to pray. I feel the leading of God, I'm gonna serve. I feel the leading of God, I'm gonna sacrifice. Things are going great. And then you hit this season where you don't feel the leading, you don't feel the spirit, you don't see the signs, you don't see the heavens being open. You just get devil like, ow, 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 ow. and you're like, uh, Holy Spirit? where are we what's going on did you leave me dump me I mean what's what's going on and the Holy Spirit is silent what do you do when God stops speaking what do you do when you stop feeling him when you feel like you hit a dry spell I'm gonna teach with teach you or share with you I've been practicing this because as a young person I hit that so many times and I found myself panicking this desperate screaming to God sometimes fasting even more say God I want to hear you not realizing the Holy Spirit hides in the Holy Scriptures in the time of my wilderness Jesus didn't rely on the experience he relied on the scriptures you don't see Jesus going back to the Jordan and say hey Holy Ghost why didn't you go with me you don't see Jesus say, Father, where are you? Jesus simply opened his mouth. He said, it is written, it is written. And the devil was leaving because the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your hardest day, where you don't feel like God is talking back or he is near you, at that moment, the Spirit of the living God can, might not be found in your favorite Hillsong song or Elevation song or Bethel song. You will find him in your favorite verse. When you stand on that verse, when you recite that verse, when you comfort yourself with the verse and you put your feelings in the back seat and you say, you know what, I don't feel anything but I know my Redeemer lives. I know whom I have believed and I stand on that. This too will pass. I will come out of this and I will feel it again. But until then, I'll stand on the Word of God. You may say, but that's not like Holy Spirit, you know, being driven by the Holy Spirit. You can't be closer to the Holy Spirit than being in His Word. He wrote the book and He's in it especially when you don't feel him. I like to say like this, when you no longer feel the Holy Spirit, feed yourself with the Holy Scriptures. Amen. When you no longer feel the Spirit, feed yourself with the Holy Scriptures until they speak to you, until something snaps. There was a young lady, her name is Christine, and um, 
at the age of two when she was being, uh, uh, being taken, uh, somebody was taking pictures of her family picture and they put her on a horse and uh, flash from the camera spooked the fo horse, horse jumped and a little two-year-old baby fell from the horse and suffered a brain damage. Very short time after that, she, de she developed seizures. She developed epileptic, epileptic seizures. She went to school and she, those seizures would happen randomly every few days or so. It was a very painful experience for her because in school they called her little Caesar's pizza. They made fun of her. She didn't want to live. She tried to end her life twice by, by taking certain medicine to kill herself. She would cut herself just to relieve herself of the pain. At the age of 13, those seizures really increased. A year 2000, they decided to do a surgery on her, on her front lobe of the brain, remove certain things to kind of uh, cut back on the, the grandness or the, the power of those seizures. During the operating table, she had a stroke. So not only the surgery wasn't effective in removing the seizures, now she was dealing with part of her body paralyzed. She needed to go to therapy just to get the body working again. Her life was really, really devastating. She felt trapped and she felt hopeless. She wasn't able to drive, she wasn't able to work. She just stayed at home, watched TV, and that's all. One time she was watching a Christian program, and during the Christian program, a lady gave what we call the word of knowledge. Or she, she gave a word, she says, as she was praying, she says, I see a woman who had an injury to the head. At the young age, that had something to do with the horse. And she says, this young lady said this, God is healing you right now. Christine was sitting on the couch, she jumped, and she says, this is my chance. She says, Lord, I receive your word. I receive your promise. I stand on it. And her faith was so real. Her faith was so genuine that for the next 30 days, she no longer had the seizures. She was so excited. She was so happy. Except on the 30th day, seizures came back. They came back worse than ever before. She starts shaking at the kitchen table because of the seizures. And, and in her mind, while her body was out of control, her mind was being flooded with thoughts that you're not healed. See, you're always going to be like that. You, you're never, your situation will never change. God didn't heal you. He let you down. He tricked you. And she said, I had an option. Do I stick with what I've always known or do I stick with the word from God that I got? And she says, right there at the kitchen floor, not being able to control my body, I started to fight in my mind and say, you know what, Lord, I believe your word. I believe your promise. And I believe that by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed on the cross. And when that prayer was offered for me, that it's for me. And though I see what my, was happening in my body, I don't ignore that, but I'm not going to stand on that. The power of God's word. Today, it's been 12 years since Christine had her last seizure. God completely set her free. She, had a, she has a license now. She's an ordained minister. She wrote a book and she helps other women. I am not saying that that's how your situation will be, but I am saying there is power in God's word when you don't feel God's spirit because the Holy Spirit is in the Holy Scripture when you don't feel Him in your wilderness. I want you to rise. Precious Father, I thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you that you came to introduce us to your Holy Spirit. You're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I want us to pray together right now. We're going to pray the first prayer point. If you can put that up for us. I want you to pray with me. So I'm going to say it and then you just repeat after me. And so we're going to pray together. I want you to say this with me. Say, Father God, teach us how to walk and to live with our mentor our companion, our helper, our comforter, and our friend, the Holy Spirit. Place your hand on your heart right now. Say this with me. Say, draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I may love only what is holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my works too may be holy. Breathe in me, Oh Holy Spirit, that my thoughts all may be holy. Strengthen me, oh Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me, oh Holy Spirit, that I may always be holy. 
guide me oh Holy Spirit that at all times I may do what is right in your sight come on let's just take 30 seconds right now just allow the Holy Spirit to fill you right now if you've been dry or maybe you, you feel like you're in that wilderness just just open yourself up for just 30 seconds begin to say Holy Spirit I need you maybe you've never talked to Holy Spirit you can do that right now maybe you've grieved the Holy Spirit you've ignored him reconnect right now he is your friend he's not a force you control he's a friend that he wants to have fellowship with you just take a moment say Holy Spirit fill me with your holiness fill me with the righteousness fill me with the desire to know God I'm hungry I am desperate I want to know this relationship that Jesus was talking about I need you in the name of Jesus Father fill us with your spirit right now Jesus bring the reality of your Holy Spirit in our life right now in Jesus mighty name in Jesus mighty name but now we're gonna take a moment and I want to pray for those who are sick and the reason why I do that especially with this message is that this week AC went out in my house on Monday as an owner of the house it was personal I didn't like it I fixed it the next day somebody came and fixed it and today as we were happy having the service in the first service kind of like the Lord reminded me he says I care so much about every pain that my children face because their bodies is my house when the AC goes out I care for it if your back goes out Holy Spirit says I care for it if your vision goes out I care for it if you can't sleep at night I care for it if you have ear infections I care for it and so I'm gonna ask you as an act of faith place your hand upon a part of your body where you've been experiencing pain and let's pray that together right now that the Holy Spirit who actually is the owner of our body will take care of it will help us today in Jesus name pray this prayer with me say my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit my body is not for sickness and it's not for disease oh Holy Spirit bring healing to any area of weakness and pain in Jesus name father I pray right now that you will bring healing to every person that's struggling with their back I pray that that shoulder injury at work will be healed right now in Jesus name Lord I pray that this the gastritis is going to be broken that, that arthritis in the joints in the knees will be healed Lord I pray father in the name of Jesus those ear infections that buzzing in the ear that right now you're just going to remove that your precious presence is in this room that you'll right now bring your healing and that you'll begin to restore things that went out of our body because your our bodies is your temple Holy Spirit move mightily right now among us bring your restoration Lord we receive your touch in Jesus name in Jesus mighty name thank you for watching this content I hope this was a blessing to you if you're like me and you like to click on things click on this subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it and remember the best is yet to come